Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 10 of LTech 676. Quiet. I want to begin by soliciting some feedback about the changes we've made to the schedule. As you know, last week we experimented with changing the due dates of the weekly assignments. This change meant that the critical reflection was due on Sunday instead of Saturday, and the peer response was due on Tuesday instead of Monday. So I put together a one-item poll to determine if we should keep this change or go back to normal. So one of the first things I need you to do is simply answer, should we keep the new schedule? Yes, no, or I don't care. Please do that as soon as possible, and I will update the assignment due dates for this coming week based on your feedback. Of course, Critical Reflection 6 was all about applying the ethical matrix. We were introduced to the idea of using brain wave trackers to detect students' level of concentration and how this might impact students themselves as well as teachers as well as parents and school systems. I enjoy taking a look at your ethical matrices. They were really interesting and I thought you did a great job of articulating the rationale behind the design of your matrix. A couple of things that I thought were interesting, of course, almost everybody had students and teachers and parents and the schools themselves represented as stakeholders. Only a few of you thought outside of that kind of traditional box to include tech companies, governments, and even course designers as well. Keep in mind that the ethical matrix is designed to include all stakeholders so that we can get folks thinking about and discussing the complexities of educational technology initiatives. If used correctly, an ethical matrix can help us identify issues and focus debates. It can be a good vehicle for discussion. It can tease out issues and people's feelings on different values or from different perspectives. And it really enables the decision-making process. I hope you found this exercise related to the ethical matrix concept valuable. Now, of course, in your weekly videos, we had a little Easter egg fun, which I really appreciated. Tamara let us know Halloween is her favorite holiday and the night before Christmas is her favorite Halloween movie. And just for fun, Bin Bin found a 38 word sentence in this week's reading. And so she pointed out that that's pretty impressive and without any punctuation makes it pretty difficult to parse. And so I thought I'd join in on the fun and ask, can you find a fun Halloween GIF or GIF? I found one here, What Up Boo, with a ghost in it. And if you need help finding one, check out giphy.com slash Halloween for lots of options. All right, folks, let's get into the main part of today's video. Now, I want to move forward to talk about our next theme. And as you know, we have five themes in LTech 676. We started with theme one, the nature of educational technology. Theme two was technology and equity in schools. Theme three was racial and ethnic divides, differences in needs. And today we're beginning our fourth theme, which is giving voice and disempowering structural inequalities. Now, when we're talking about structural inequalities. I hope your mind is drawing a dotted line to our illustrated analogy of inequity when it comes to education and opportunity in society. And so theme four is going to be talking about giving voice and disempowering those structural inequalities. Now to do that, we began reading the first chapter of Disruptive Fixation by Christo Sims. And Sims argues that we are accustomed to arguments that herald recent breakthroughs in information and communication technologies for their potential to reinvent outmoded educational systems, to develop areas of the world with high rates of poverty, or to knit together the planet in a harmonious way. In other words, Sims argues that we're used to the idea that some new technology is going to address societal ills. 
we are, for, for a lack of a better term, sold this idea over and over again, that technology is a way to address these problems. And on the very first page, Sims reveals his perspective on this, stating that what is puzzling is how so many of us hope and even demand that the next time will be different. He acknowledges that technology never has addressed all of these problems. And so he's puzzled by the continued hope and even demand that the next round of technologies is actually going to make a difference. Of course, this ties right into where we began the course with this idea that society has long-standing and stubborn problems or societal ills, such as poverty, homelessness, discrimination, low civil engagement. This brings us to an important concept that Christo Sims talks about in his book, which he labels perennial rejuvenation of optimism and idealism. Now, I want to connect this idea to Gartner's hype cycle. Gartner, of course, is the big technology consulting company, and it claims that the hype cycle is a graphical representation of the maturity and adoption of technologies and applications and how they are potentially relevant relevant to solving problems and exploiting new opportunities. Gartner claims that the hype cycle graphic provides a view of how a technology or application will evolve over time, providing some insight on how to leverage it within the context of an organization's or sector's specific goals. Now, importantly, the hype cycle, according to Gartner, has five phases. And they plot these phases, keeping in mind expectations and time. Now, the first phase is what they call the innovation trigger. And this happens when a potential technology breakthrough kicks things off. This might be an early proof of concept and stories and media begin to trigger significant publicity about this particular breakthrough. At this point, there's no usable products or commercial viability. It, everything at this point is really just prototypes and, and its viability is largely unproven. From there, we have the second phase, which is the peak of inflated expectations. And at this point, early publicity produces a number of success stories. Some companies may take action to take advantage of the new breakthrough or the new technology, and others may not. After the peak of inflated expectations, we have the trough of disillusionment. Is Notice how expectations have reached a bottom. At this point, interest wanes as experiments and implementations fail to deliver on their promises. Producers of the technology shake out or fail. Investments continue only if the surviving providers of the technology improve their products to the satisfaction of the early adopters. So you can see here, it's kind of the, the opposite of the peak of inflated expectations. Everyone becomes disillusioned. This technology is not what we thought it was going to be. From there, we have the slope of enlightenment. This is the fourth phase. And what happens in this phase is that more instances of how the technology can benefit a sector start to become obvious and more widely understood. Second and third generation products appear from technology providers and more conservative companies begin to express interest in adopting the technology. From here, we reach the plateau of productivity, the fifth and final phase of Gartner's hype cycle. In the plateau of productivity, mainstream adoption starts to take off. Criteria for assessing the viability are more clearly defined, and the technology's broad market applicability and relevance are clearly paying off. So at this point, pretty much everyone is on board and people know how to use the technology, how to implement it, and it's solving concrete problems. So there you have the five phases of Gartner's hype cycle. Now, I want to connect these five phases to Christo Sims' idea of, of the perennial rejuvenation of optimism and idealism. And so as educators, I want to ask all of you, where would you place the following educational technologies on the slope of the hype cycle? Where would you put learning management systems? Where would you put one-to-one -one laptop programs? 
Where would you put virtual and augmented reality? And finally, where would you put the brainwave trackers from Critical Reflection 6? Where do you think those fall on, on Gartner's hype cycle? Let's connect Gartner's hype cycle back to the headlines that we looked at earlier in the semester. Is it possible that the hype cycle helps explain the spectrum of perspectives that we've seen in the popular press? On the one hand, on the left, we might say we're seeing the peak of inflated expectations about the role of technology in education, whereas on the right, we're seeing the trough of disillusionment when it comes to specific technologies in schools. Now, another important point that makes is that education is remarkable for the extent to which it is repeatedly targeted for disruption, especially in the United States. He makes the point that even with all of these societal ills, education is the sector that is repeatedly targeted for disruption by technology. And he points out on page five, public debates about education reform tend to focus narrowly on how to fix education educational structures rather than on asking whether these are the right structures to be fixing in order to bring about hoped for social outcomes. In other words, yes, there may be educational structures that need to be fixed, but are those the structures that are ultimately going to help us deal with poverty, unemployment, low civil engagement, so on and so forth. Sims wants us to explore these questions, and he does this by presenting a case study of what he calls the downtown school. Now, we'll talk more about the downtown school next week, but for now, let's set it up like this. The downtown school was put together to address an important problem, according to the techno-philanthropists that funded the downtown school. And the problem, as these philanthropists saw it, was we're living in a radically new, interconnected, technologically saturated, and unequal era. The problem is our inherited educational institutions are woefully out of date. So what was the solution? Well, the solution proposed by the techno-philanthropists was to put together a new school for digital kids where the entire pedagogy would be organized like a game and students would learn to be creative makers, remixers, and hackers of technology and culture. So that's kind of the premise of the downtown school. And Christo Sims is going to walk us through what actually happened at the downtown school in terms of what it hoped to achieve and what it actually ended up achieving, which is what we'll look at next week. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.